Welcome to the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project panel discussion, Veteran Grown Urban Farming. I'm Karen Loy, Director of the Veterans History Project and an Army Veteran. On behalf of the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden, I'd like to thank you for choosing to join us today. I would like to thank our moderator, Margot O'Hale, and all the panelists for accepting our invitation to share their experiences and expertise. I would especially like to thank all the veterans, both in the panel and in our viewing audience for their service and the sacrifices they have made for our country. It is through oral history that we learn about the life and experiences and perspectives of people who might otherwise not appear in the historical record. And oral history also provides a rich opportunity for human interaction. Congress greatly understood this concept when it established the Veterans History Project in October 2000 by unanimous decision. The Veterans History Project mission is to collect, preserve, and make accessible the firsthand remembrances of U.S. military veterans for future generations so that they may better understand what veterans saw, felt, and heard. Since its establishment, the Veterans History Project have, has archived more than 111,000 collections from the brave men and women who served from World War I through the current conflicts. As our veterans come home and transition back into civilian life, they often face many challenges from physical and emotional health to finding employment and re-engaging with their communities. Farming and other careers related to the agriculture work have proven to be beneficial to veterans, their families, and communities. Our panelists will share with you how they have achieved success and how they have each found a unique way to pay forward. We'll be monitoring the comments section and look forward to your questions. First, we are honored that Representative Kim Schreier, representing Washington's 8th District, a member of the House Agricultural Committee and an ardent supporter of VHP, chose to participate with us today via a welcome video. Good afternoon. I'm Congresswoman Kim Schreier from Washington's 8th Congressional District. Thank you for joining us for the Library of Congress Veterans History Project's panel, Veteran Grown Urban Farming, as we delve into the fascinating topic of veterans who work in sustainable agricultures in urban settings, as well as the specialized programs that support them. This is the first of two panels on veteran farming that the Veterans History Project will host. The next one, Veteran Grown Farming, will focus on farming in places other than urban settings. So stay tuned for details on that event. As a former pediatrician and a member of the House Committee on Agriculture, I recognize the importance of having a sustainable, equitable, and resilient food system in place. And I know that begins with agriculture. Farming does not always require large tracts of lands. It can be done in the most heavily populated city, in someone's yard, on a vacant lot, or even on a rooftop. It includes beekeeping, hydroponics, shipping container farming, and so much more. Oftentimes, urban gardens are tied into educational and training programs, philanthropic event endeavors, or commerce opportunities that help build strong communities. Those that are veteran owned or support veterans programs are particularly near and dear to my heart because their vet benefits extend beyond the veterans to the entire community. As you watch today's panel, it is my hope that you will be inspired to support an existing veteran-run urban farm near you, or even consider starting your own. The Veterans History Project is home to more than 111,000 veterans collections to date, making it the nation's largest repository of veterans' firsthand stories and a valuable resource for researchers, educators, students, and everyday people. For more information, visit www.loc.gov slash vets. That's www.loc.gov slash vets with an S. Thank you and enjoy the panel. Thank you, Representative Schreier, for your kind words and for your commitment to veterans and the ag community. The Veterans History Project prides itself on being nonpartisan and treasures the support and active participation we receive from both sides of the aisle. I was first introduced to our moderator, Margot Hale, last summer when we decided to host a panel to discuss farming as a viable and increasingly popular career path for veterans. Margot played an active role on our planning team. The more the team talked about issues around veterans who farm and the people and programs that support them, 
it became clear that not only is she an expert on these issues, but she knows almost everybody who works in this field. Her background as a child of dairy farmers and her current line of work make her the perfect person to facilitate this discussion. Margo is the Southeast Regional Director for the National Center for Appropriate Technology, otherwise known as NCAT, and also serves as the Sustainable Livestock Specialist for NCAT's Ultra Sustainable Ag Program. Since 2011, Margo has led NCAT's efforts to train military veterans interested in agriculture through farm to farm. She has worked in the fields of sustainable livestock production, beginning farmer training, farmer outreach and education, regional sustainable agriculture outreach. Margo has extensive experience in developing and implementing farmer trainings, has written dozens of sustainable livestock production publications, manages farm to school efforts through Food Corps Arkansas, and has given many presentations and workshops throughout the country. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Margo Hale. Welcome everyone and thank you so much to our panelists. Um, I will quickly introduce them before I give them a chance to share their stories with you. We have Sarah Dachos from Washington, D.C. Sean Dahlgren from Linden, Washington. And Jeanette Lombardo from Sacramento, California. So Sean, um, let's start with you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Um, my name is Sean Dahlgarn. I'm a United States Air Force veteran. I enlisted in 2005 and uh, honorably discharged in 2009. I deployed to Iraq twice, Kirkuk, Northern Iraq in 2005, Baghdad in 2007, and, and Kuwait in 2008. I got out in 2009, and um, I've been working with veterans uh, ever since. I'm also the executive director of Growing Veterans. We're a nonprofit uh, based out of Linden, Washington. All right, Sarah, we'll go to you next. Well, thank you, Margo. I'm so grateful to be here today. Grateful that I've been asked to be on this panel because of what I'm doing, which is something I truly love and feel strongly about. Working on the urgent issues of environmental justice and climate change mitigation in some of our most mar marginalized DC neighborhoods by installing on-site composting machines and training local people how to maintain and service them. How I got there is a long story and I will try to summarize it, which is I joined the Navy in 1989 um, and I when I attended the United States Naval Academy. I came from a family of Navy grads. My father and brother were both uh, graduates. Um, so it was logical that I would follow in their footsteps. My nephew recently graduated from there and it looks like my youngest one is also pursuing a Naval Academy education in a couple of years. So it runs in the family. Um, upon commissioning, I attended the flight school, I attended flight school, excuse me, and became a P3 pilot, then just pursued, frankly, a typical naval career. I was stationed both abroad and here in the US before retiring at 21 years. Much of my time in service, I thought about our waste, about how much waste the Navy produces. I recall even as a young girl, taking part in what they called a princess cruise in which daughters are allowed to be aboard for a few days where they're serving parents, being shocked at the garbage that was dumped overboard. Tons and tons of garbage, it seemed to me, which of course it was not tons, but I was young with a lack of ability to spatially measure. Um, I was heartened that years later, under Secretary Malbus, who served from 2008 to 2016, the Secretary of the Navy, he made significant efforts to green the Navy, calling it the Great, the Great Green Fleet as a play on Teddy Roosevelt's Great White Fleet via innovative fuels like those made from switchgrass and algae and maximizing renewable energy on base locations, to name just a few of his initiatives. Though Secretary Malbus was highly concerned with climate change, his ideas were able to take hold because they were driven by national security concerns. How can we afford to maintain national security with the current price of non-renewable energy resources? And that idea really took root with me. How can we convince all sides to see that climate change can be solved not only for ecological reasons, but for economic ones as well? I got involved with farming soon after I left the Navy, more as a hobby. But because I soon learned about how effective regenerative farming can be, how much it can help reverse the effects of climate change via carbon sequestration, and how economically beneficial regenerative farming can be for the producer, not to mention how conventional farming contributes to almost 40% of total greenhouse gas emissions. 
I was soon on my way to a new career. As I continued to work in this space, I learned more about how racially discriminatory our agricultural sector is as well. And as a racial justice advocate for many years, I've spent a great deal of my time in ag trying to influence policy to counter that. Loop closing was a great combination for both. And I look forward to talking to you about that in more detail during our, our, our discussion today. Wow, thank you, Sarah. All right, Jeanette, please share um, about the work you're doing and how you are here to serve our farmer veterans. So thank you, Margo, uh, for having me today. So I am the executive director for the Farmer Veteran Coalition. Uh, like Sarah, you know, uh, getting into this role is a journey. Uh, I was born in Wiesbaden, Germany. My father was in the Air Force. Uh, when he discharged from the Air Force, he went back home which was a small rural farming community outside of Erie, Pennsylvania. My family uh, were farmers and, and, and dairy farmers actually. And so grew up in that environment, went to Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania, which there's a lot of Irish in that part of Pennsylvania. So uh, then went to Cal State Fullerton. I was an agricultural lender for 24 years, working throughout the United States. Um, and then working, leaving that industry um, and going into advocacy for agriculture, both at the local, state, and federal level. Um, my first state appointment was on the LA Regional Water Quality Control Board, which was an appointment through um, Governor Schwarzenegger. And then that led to a federal appointment to the USDA Foreign Ag Services Division, where I worked on the Food Safety Modernization Act. Uh, this past June, my second federal appointment has been with the US EPA Farmer, Rancher, and Rural Communities uh, Committee, where I work on uh, the three charges that have been given to us uh, by Andrew Wheeler and continuing on with the new administration, which is on um, food uh, waste, uh, water quality, and quantity, and um, coming up with a holistic pesticide program. So those are the three issues I'm working on now. Um, I, if it wasn't for COVID, I wouldn't be at Farmer Veteran Coalition. <laughs> Literally because my whole world was shut down, I was actually answered the phone call when the recruiter called. So that was uh, a really good thing for me. And this job, as you can tell, takes everything that I am and puts it in a nice little package with a little red bow on top of it. So it allows me to advocate for farmers, advocate for veterans, which are a huge part of my family. Um, and I understand their roles, their issues, their challenges. So it's, it's uh, very fulfilling. Thank you so much. As you can see, our panelists are amazing and have some great experiences. So we'll, we'll get into some of the questions now and um, hear from them. So, Sean, once again, I'm going to start with you. And would you please share a little bit about your organization and, and more specifically the farm involved that's um, part of that organization and um, and really how your military service has impacted the work there with, you know, with the farm and with the other veterans that you're working with. So just give us a little bit more information about that. Absolutely. So, like I mentioned before, I'm the executive director at Growing Veterans, and I'm a veteran myself. And um, Growing Veterans' mission is to empower military veterans to grow food, community, and each other. And those are three very important components to um, reintegrating from active duty service into civilian life. Um, one big thing that we've identified, um, or specifically that I've experienced getting out of the military, is that you lose something that you can't really identify right away, right away. And one of um, the things that you, you lose is camaraderie and a sense of belonging to a mission and that's bigger than yourself. And for me personally, um, to be able to reconnect with other veterans in the community through sustainable agriculture has been transformative in so many ways. Um, growing food is, is pretty explanatory. We are a three acre organic certified farm. Um, we grow a myriad of your row crops to include hops and, um, and peppers, so on and so forth. And we partner with local businesses to create value added items. Um, we are also a, um, 
a host site for uh, veterans that are going through school via the VA work study. Um, and then we're also an approved veteran conservation Corps internship site. And um, one thing that's really important about bringing all these people together is that we're able to work towards a top common goal and we provide opportunities for people to um, learn about sustainable agriculture better themselves. And a big key component to that is peer support. And that's one of the pillars of what we do. We meet people where they're at, whether they've experienced trauma or they're interested in just learning about veterans affairs or getting involved with an organization that cares about its community. Um, a big part of what we've done this year due to COVID-19 is donate uh, 4,800 pounds of all the produce that we've grown this year to our local food banks to fight the, um, the need that's become far more prevalent, especially since COVID-19. And so that's been a huge driving force for us. We invite the community to come out. While we are a veterans organization, we are not a veterans club. Anybody that wants to be out there can come out and get involved. We've had everyone visit the farm from World War II to Vietnam, to Korea, to, um, you know, uh, OIF, OEF, desert storms, so on and so forth. So we invite everyone to come out to the farm. And we also have another location that we just recently opened on Whidbey Island, which is um, really close to NAS Whidbey, which is a large veteran population. I believe it's the largest per capita in Washington state. So we're trying to reach out to folks active duty specifically um, because there's a lot of folks that are coming out of the military and don't have any idea of what they want to do. We want to catch them before they fall. So that's a big part of what we do. We also have an accredited peer support training that we've developed. Um, we've trained hundreds of veterans and non-veterans to be able to go out into the world, whether they go off to another veteran organization or they go home and they interact with folks and they utilize those skills to be able to meet people where they're at, navigate difficult conversations, whether they relate to trauma and be there where that person is. Hopefully, um, being able to catch them before they fall into, you know, um, dangerous, self-inflicted behavior. So um, that's a big part of what we do, and we just want to share it with the world. Wow. Well, thank you, Sean. Um, now, now you've shared it with a lot more people, so I know there'll be folks um, <laughs> checking you guys out and all the good work that you're doing. So thank you so much. So. Sarah, I want to ask you, I know that um, besides what you're doing with your composting business, um, you also have been an urban beekeeper and um, have worked in kind of urban food systems. And so please, you know, share a little bit about that work and kind of how you, how you, um, you know, really made that jump um, into agriculture production with, with your bees and, and other aspects. Yeah, sure. Um, well, you know, when I first got out of the Navy, I, like I said, I started farming as a hobby. Um, I was uh, not sure what I wanted to do. It was, you know, as Sean implied, it, it is such an incredible jump to leave the military. And in, in my case, I was a Navy brat as well. So I had really been in the military for 40 years when I finally got out. Um, so I took six months off and I thought I was just going to go back into corporate world. Um, or go into corporate world, you know, I, I, and by volunteering at this local farm that was in the city, um, and it, that served, it had a, a mobile market that served um, wards, the two wards in our um, city that are really very um, marginalized and don't have great access to uh, supermarkets or dense nutritious food. Uh, to give you perspective, there's 220,000 people who live in those two neighborhoods, and there's um, only three supermarkets. Um, so it, it was uh, quite an eye opener as a military person. I just was never exposed to any of that. I didn't know about our food systems. I didn't know. Uh, I mean, the good, the bad, the ugly, whatever. I didn't know anything about them. I just ate. Uh, so um, that was my connection with food systems. Um, so um, working on this farm really opened my eyes, uh, both to farming in general. I um, loved it. I loved harvesting. I loved weeding. I think a lot of people actually love to weed. Um, I loved, no. <laughs> It's very, you know, it can be very satisfying. Um, and I loved the business end of it as well. Surprisingly, I know a lot of farmers don't like the business end, but I really enjoyed that. 
Um, and uh, I was exposed to beekeeping there. So I took a beekeeping class and became a beekeeper, um, as you stated. And I had at one point, I had five different um, hives all over the city. I was mentoring quite a few people um, in the city, really teaching people how to beekeep and um, and figuring out ways for them to get funding to buy beekeeping equipment. And um, we have a really uh, strong beekeepers alliance in DC. So being able to connect people with those people so they could have harvesting equipment, um, so they could sell their honey. Um, and in DC, we have a very strong food policy council that helps uh, beginner farmers or beginner producers, beginner uh, uh, merchants, anybody who's in the food system, so are really able to help people make that leap uh, from maybe cottage uh, industry to something a little bit bigger. Um, and I've been involved in that um, for uh, five years now and uh, really enjoy it. I really love um, allowing people um, or helping people uh, to see that they have it in them to uh, be their own producers. And it's a it's a leap. It's a leap of faith. Right. Um, especially if you have you know children or, you, you know, you're not you're not just relying on yourself or that people are relying on you. It's a leap of faith. Um, and that's something I want us to talk about also is some of the questions I know you're going to ask about, like the challenges of, of, of farming. I mean, that's one of the biggest ones that it can be economically uh, challenging and burdensome. And so to, to know what resources are out there um, that can help you, whether it's through nonprofits or your local governments um, has been uh, it's a key to it. And that has really been, yes, I do beekeep. I do sell my honey. Um, I am considered a farmer under USDA because I sell enough of it for that. I'm, 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 I can do the US, USDA census, um, but uh, really my passion is in helping others to make that leap themselves. And that's what I've been doing. And I would say almost now almost every larger municipality has some type of food policy council. And that's a great way for you to get in the know of what is happening in your um, own uh, local government. Um, and also to help influence policy, you know, if you're on the food policy council, or if you write to people on the food policy council, if you're in connection with people in the food policy council, um, to to let them know what your issues are um, that can help your your own operations. That's a that's a really good thing to do. Yes, thank you so much, Sarah. And yes, we will talk about some resources and and how. Um, all of us here on the call, you know, the, the services and programs that we offer and how you can get connected to those. But you're right, there, there is a lot of help out there. And um, that's part of this is getting folks connected to that to see how that they can plug into, you know, urban farming or agriculture or any of these food system pieces. So thanks for sharing that, Sarah. Jeanette, you, you shared about, you know, kind of how you came to work for a Farmer Veteran Coalition and obviously your long um, connection to military veterans and how that is important to you. Um, could you share just a little bit more about the Farmer Veteran Coalition and how they serve um, farmer veterans across the country? So our, our focus is on beginning farmers uh, and ranchers and really uh, transitioning uh, those that are leaving the military, um, giving, letting, allowing them to explore uh, the, the various careers and types of farming and, um, and methods of farming that are out there for agriculture. A lot of our veterans, they came, they went into the military because they lived in rural communities. Uh, and when they get out, they want to go back because their family's there. But there, maybe the reason they went in, there was no opportunities for employment there. Uh, and to go back means sometimes that hasn't changed. So creating a, a, a company and starting farming, uh, and, and sometimes it goes in steps, right? We have your beginning farmers and you, you, uh, you know, grow and, and we go in mid, mid range and eventually some, you know, I think initially they start a lot with part-time employment and then they work their way uh, into letting the farm just be the business. But, you know, I think when Michael Agron started this, he realized that, you know, our, our farmers across this country, which is like one to two percent of the population was decreasing. The average age was increasing and uh, they were dying off and we needed to fill that uh, to make sure we have food security. And the fit between veterans and farmers is very 
good fit because you know it's a purpose you work every day to feed people i mean um and a lot of people feel this is like you know god's purpose for them is like you know feeding people three times a day every day day after day and it fills this mission in them and i think just working with the dirt and raising animals it's uh healing in, in many different ways and it's a great quality of life that i think we all would love to do but um you know we when you have never worked um worked in farming before or, or grew up in it or even our urban farmers you know uh where do you start what do you do and that's sort of where we come in you know we help with career counseling we help with um you know doing business plans and crop plans and getting financing we help with technical support as far as you know what to grow what's my water quality what's my soil samples you know the real technical questions uh we help with uh getting financing using your benefits you know uh that are available to veterans because uh, that is a whole other puzzle uh that is hard to maneuver sometimes and then you know we do peer-to-peer -peer support we have we're a national nonprofit. we have currently 15 chapters up and running uh largely thanks to sarah she started that when she worked with us but we have uh, after our conference last november we have 23 right now in the hopper uh that we're trying to get up and running and we're about 23,000 members right now. We're adding about 400 a month. And so there's this huge tsunami of new people coming uh, that we have to, that we're going through growth, which is a, a great uh, issue to have. So it's very exciting. But what happens at the chapter level is that peer to peer support uh, where, you know, my tractor broke down. Can I borrow yours? I'm, I'm trying, you know, because you're close, so you all experience the same issue. Is whether it's a weather issue or a trade issue or a disease issue, maybe with what you're growing. So it allows folks to come together and work through some of those problems. You know, we do a lot of resource referrals. We have um, some great partners, Wounded Warrior, we added this year, Combined Arms Institute. Uh, so we have this, oh, I have to say close to 300 uh, groups across the country that help our, our members in a number of ways. We do offer corporate discounts. I was hearing Sarah talk about her beekeeping. Um, we have a lot of beekeepers that find peace uh, in in the noise of the hives, so to, to speak. And so they just enjoy it to create something from nothing and grow a business from nothing is very exciting for them. Um, so we offer corporate discounts so people can uh, buy the things that they need. Uh, we also have a lot of programs. We have the Homegrown by Heroes program, uh, which is a labeling, it's a marketing program uh, that helps our farmers sell their products uh, in the farmer's markets or, or CSAs or however they sell it. We have a new uh, one that we'll probably talk about when we get into COVID called Market Maker uh, that helps people sell their products. We have a fellowship program, which actually is out um, right now, uh, where we give mini grants, like from one to five thousand uh, dollars, we've, we've given over like three million dollars in mini grants to help people launch and continue to grow their farms. Uh, we've starting a training program this year. Um, Kubota called us and they're like, "I need a thousand mechanics, you know, set up a training program." So we're doing that. We're working us on some drone flying training programs and some pesticide applicator programs so um and we're also looking at remote jobs because about oh 59 percent right now i think of our membership is in some way classified as uh, has a disability ranking so it allows them to um you know with covid we realize remote jobs are possible uh so we're looking at working with ag uh, career placement agencies uh, to get the jobs that are in the agricultural sector but don't require you to work in the field. So say logistics or marketing or um, compliance uh, that people can do from their homes with the support of their families. And so we're looking at uh, doing a little bit of that and we're actually uh, just starting a new partnership with Psych Armor uh, and working on some of the mental health issues because 
we have to face the reality that we've put two groups of people together that have a high suicide rate, farming and veterans. And, um, you know, I, you just can't ignore that. Uh, so we, you know, I think especially during COVID, people have taken a different attitude towards mental health uh, because we've all been, uh, you know, ang anxious. We've all had uh, panic attacks and been uh, maybe some depression. And, you know, so I think everybody can relate to that. And uh, there's much more um, willingness to talk about it now, which has been great. So that's sort of who, who we are and what we do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeanette. And um, as you can see, um, everyone should look up Farmer Veteran Coalition and um, join them as a, as a member. If you're a, a veteran interested in farming or you're a support person who wants to support farmer veterans, definitely get connected to them and, um, and find a chapter if there's a chapter in your state. I am I'm on the board of the Arkansas Farmer and Better um, Farmer Veteran Coalition chapter, so um, it is a really great organization, and um, they provide so many resources and support for our farmer veterans and and help them get connected to um, all the resources available all across the country. So definitely, um, please look up Farmer Veteran Coalition. So my next question is for Sean and Sarah. And since you guys have both been actively involved in production in an urban setting, um, if you could share with you what have been some of the challenges that you've seen, um, you know, with your production, your farming production, but also what are some of the, the benefits or the good things that you've seen um, with your production? And Sean, I'll go ahead and start with you. Well, I'll start with the benefits for sure. Um, I, I hear the the word dirt therapy um, thrown around or words, um, and that's that's a big part of what we do. I think paradoxically, what matters with growing veterans is that food is a byproduct of the people doing well. Our product is ultimately people, and um, if we take care of them, then the food comes. Um, it's definitely a lot. More, there's a lot more to it than that, but that's kind of the easy way to break it down. Ideally, for us, you know. Um, We'll have a, a good growing season where we're able to donate a lot of food. We're able to um, partner with local businesses to produce um, value-added products. So we grow peppers and, and um, garlic, and we have honey in our apiary that we harvest and extract. And we uh, partner with El Fuego Hot Sauce, which is a local hot sauce producer, and we make our fire in the whole hot sauce, which we are able to put a homegrown uh, by Heroes label on. Thank you, Jeanette. And, um, yeah, it's fantastic. It gives our veterans and the community something to buy into. And that's ultimately what we're looking for, because our goal is to build community camaraderie and ultimately abolish the isolation that leads to veteran suicide. That's our number one pie in the sky vision. And um, what we are, we are also a stepping stone, a professional stepping stone for a lot of uh, veterans and non-veterans that come out to the farm, whether it's through the form of internships, VA work study, so on and so forth. So growing food for us is really important because what it does is it shows that you can bring life into this world. You can um, kind of change yourself um, from the ground up, essentially, and, and repurpose yourself or find, find something under the umbrella of sustainable agriculture that, that that entices you, whether it's marketing or or physically growing the food or so on and so forth. But um, some of the some of the the difficulties can be, uh, you know, for someone breaking out into this type of work could be marketing, um, finding markets that you can um, break into, whether it's uh, you know uh, finding someone to buy your produce or uh, finding a way to um, you know, get it out into the world is really the most difficult part. As far as I know, there's a lot of people that grow food. There's a lot of people that do it really well. And how do you compete with that? And um, we're finding that you find, you know, you, you do what you do well and you try and find a niche. And for us personally, we're lucky that ultimately our goal is mental health and wellness. And the food comes as a byproduct of that, like I said. And our mission now is primarily to feed the community to build the community through our food. And that's a catalyst for change, positive change. And um, that's ultimately our goal. So we're very lucky, I guess, in the sense that our driving force isn't necessarily production, though we 
do produce a lot of food. Our driving force is the people and the food comes as a result of that. And we're able to pump it out into the community, feed folks that might not actually have access to the, those nourishing um, whole foods, whether it's our beets or our carrots, our lettuce, our tomatoes, so on and so forth. Um, we're also uh, grow hops, which is really exciting. We um, have five different varieties that we grow on the farm. We grow Cascade, Crystal, Centennial, Columbus, and Chinook. And we partner with local breweries, um, specifically an organic brewery called Aslan Brewery to produce our fire, our, our fire in the hole, our Charlie Foxtrot IPA. And uh, because it's a cluster of hops that we, that we use to produce this uh, fresh hop IPA, we've also partnered with other breweries as well to do um, some other small batch releases. But it's really important for veterans to see the full circle aspect of growing your product, seeing it incorporated into something and seeing it put on a shelf. And that's really what our goal is to do is in inspire, um, you know, build community and then hopefully, uh, you know, put those people out into the world and so they can make changes of their own accord. So that's 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 the short and skinny of it. Wow, thank you, Sean. And um, that's some really wonderful experiences that you're able to plug folks into so they can see that whole circle. So that's that's great. They get a chance to see the production side and the marketing side, the value added products. Um, that's really, really amazing that you have all of those things going there. So thanks for sharing that. Um, Sarah, could you, you know, share a little bit about what are some of the the challenges or benefits that you have encountered in your urban farming experience? Sure. Before I do that, though, I want to tell you that, um, Sean, my nephew is uh, he's a lieutenant JG stationed out of Washington, right north of Seattle in Everett. And he's had your Charlie Foxtrot. He thinks it's great. So keep it up. I saw that on your website and I, I asked him about it and he he knows it and loves it. So he's coming home after an 11 month deployment, which I know for the army, that's that's at your Air Force. But, you know, for army folks who are listening in, 11 months is nothing compared to what they do. But for the Navy, we usually do about nine months. So so he's really ready to get back to Seattle and drink some of your beer. Um, but yeah, so I to, to discuss uh, some of the some to the. I, Everything Sean said, I, I completely agree with him. Um, and not just, um, um, you know, with veterans, but non-veterans, we all benefit from uh, all these things uh, that Sean um, highlighted. Um, the other benefit I would say about urban gardening or farming specifically is that the last mile isn't as much of a factor with urban farming, right? Um, and that usually is such a, a big discussion item with so many farmers is how do you close that last mile? Well, if you are um, farming on a roof or if you're farming right in the city, um, you know, many of the urban farmers in Washington, D.C. talk about how that is not as much of an issue, how it's really easy to get, relatively speaking, to get that uh, produce to the restaurant, to the grocery store, or if it's a CSA, you know, right to the client. Um, and as a beekeeper, I would say that though, I mean, the, the challenges, of course, with that last mile um, with beekeeping is that most beekeeping in a city happens on the roof and most rooftops uh, in cities uh, all across the country, I don't know if this is across the world, but certainly in the US, is that their last, um, the last um, floor doesn't have an elevator and it's also a floor and a half. So you are carrying all that gear, and when you're harvesting those 100-pound boxes of, of supers of honey, uh, you're carrying that a, a, a good distance. <laughs> so, um, you know, so you definitely stay in shape by uh, being an urban farmer, I, just as much as you were with a rural, as being a rural farmer. Um, the other thing that I think is a, 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 an advantage is that the, um, the benefit of networking is so much more personal. Of course, now with the age of COVID, it's it's more uh, virtual no matter what. But because there is a more dense population of farmers in cities, you find that the uh, networking in person can be a little bit easier with a, you know higher numbers of people because there's just higher numbers of people living in vicinity of each other who are doing this work. Um, so it's really easy to get together with people Whereas, um, you know, the work I did with Farmer Veteran Coalition, we would travel to such great lengths to see one, two, three farmers 
And I know that was always something that people talked about um, that it was a little bit more challenging. So those are two benefits. But then, you know, there are some serious challenges in the urban setting. One is land access. Land, um, one, is not as accessible. There just isn't as much land in an urban environment, obviously. But also land is more expensive in an urban environment. And it's becoming more and more so as development continues. We're seeing an incredible amount of development happening um, in uh, urban settings all across our country. And that's driving up prices. And that is also bringing in more people into the cities. I know COVID is having a little bit of a counter effect to this, but not so much that it's providing more access to land for urban farmers. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a real challenge. Um, it's really difficult to get banks to give you money uh, in an urban setting for farming because they just don't think you're going to pay them back. So that's 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 real. And then the second thing is uh, regulatory challenges. Um, there are as many different regulations around urban ag as there are municipalities in this country. I swear. I, I worked on this on my my master's thesis. I have a master's in urban ag, and this was my my theme. And um, it was it's really incredible what a, a hodgepodge of regulations exist in this country. Many of these regulations date back over 100 years when cows were rightly banned for uh, hygiene reasons, but that has now affected chickens, bees. Bees are banned in almost all urban spaces. Washington, D.C. is one of the exceptions of a real city city that allows um, bees, and that was through very, very careful advocacy by the D.C. Beekeepers Alliance to make that happen, and other cities are following uh, the suit of what the DCB Keepers Alliance did to try to get bees in cities. Um, with new technologies such as hydroponics and aquaponics or roof farms, you know, how roof farms really have to be compliant with how strong and waterproof, water resistant their, their roofs are. Um, there's just a lot of confusion by city council members and mayors and their staffs on how to be open to logical regulation. Legislation is not caught up with technology. Um, I mean, for example, with my composting business, which is, you know, very, very much farming, you know, we reproduce compost that goes onto farms. Um, almost every agency in DC loves our work and has supported our work and does has various, you know, it's such a weird way that the way the DC government handles food or not, not food waste diversion, but waste diversion period. And so there's all these different agencies who are involved in our work. All of them approve it except Department of Health. Department of Health will not approve it, despite the fact that our composting uh, mechanisms are cleaner and more sealed than dumpsters that are sitting in the same spot that our composters would sit. So anybody who's new, uh, a new business has to get their uh, all of their um, parts of their business approved by Department of Health. So if you're a new business, Department of Health will reject your having an on-site composter. If you're an old business, if you're a restaurant that's already existed and then you add a composter, no problem. See, like it's just, so this is very typical across the country, uh, this type of, of, of different regulations. So be on the lookout for it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, Jeanette, do you have something to add? I would add water and energy too to that list. Because the cost of water, uh, there's no ag rate, right? When you're in the city and you're farming on a half an acre or an acre, right? So it's hard when you look at the margins that you get with vegetable production, mm. and then you have a high input cost like that, it's hard. Or if you grow inside a warehouse, right? And you're having to pay for the lights, you know, for the sun, and then you're having to pay to cool it like air conditioning, it's not, you know, that's where you run into some issues. And then, you know, there's there's been some food safety issues because some of the community spaces, um, you know, they're not fenced like you would have in rural communities. And so you may have uh, urban uh, animals using your community garden as a, <laughs> as a toilet. So, I mean, there's there's things like that that have to be worked out. And that's where, you know, where the cities, Sarah's absolutely right. It's the regulatory issues uh, to figuring out how you can do it and do it profitably, I think, so. Yes, thank you. Very important. Uh, you know, there are a lot of considerations and challenges. We don't want to discourage you though. There are definitely opportunities um, to get involved in, in urban farming. 
and um, and hopefully you, you've gained some resources and, and will um, throughout the rest of the panel to help get you connected if you're interested. Um, I want to change gears just a bit. We've all kind of talked about it. It's been mentioned several times so far in the panel, but how COVID-19 has impacted your operations and your organizations. I mean, we can't we can't um, not talk about COVID-19, and it definitely has had an impact all across the agriculture and food system sectors. I think everybody has been very aware of that this year. So um, I'll let, maybe Jeanette, we'll start with you and just, you know, maybe talk a little bit how um, FEC has addressed some of the issues with COVID-19 and, you know, maybe how, um, maybe there's been some new things come out of it because we've all had to be innovative and flexible and change how, we, how we're doing things. So please, you know, share about that. And then Sarah and Sean, I'll let you share if, um, you know, how COVID-19 has impacted your, your farm production or any of the other work that you do. Well, I have to tell you, it's been a journey <laughs> and a lot of positives have come out of it. But if you all remember, like back in March, there was there was people were walking the grocery store and there was panic, right? Because the store, the shelves were empty. First, it started with the toilet paper and then it went to, you know, any canned good, any meat. There was like nothing. And so I think one of the good things that came out of that is, um, well, I'll get to that in a minute. But first of all, there was a, in the agricultural sector, there was this huge shift away from food service. So all the hotels closed, all the venues closed, uh, you know, air, airlines closed. So all the food that was in the, being grown for that sector got dumped in the retail sector and then the pricing collapsed. And so you had a lot of food out there that was just rotting that had to be plowed under. And that was a huge financial financial loss. So that was huge. But I think what, that is where our small beginning farmers and ranchers really kicked in and really, uh, they really show, you know, really shown uh, what they could do for their community. Um, I will tell you that there was this disruption in the infrastructure. There was this lag time on, of getting products to refill uh, not that there was an absence of product, there was inventory, but uh, because there was so much hoarding happening, there was this lag time. And, and this is where people really, I think, um, stepped in, especially the small animal producers, I have to say. But uh, I think what came out of this, the bonus is people realized two things. One, the farmers are essential, right? Mm -hmm. And then they started to realize um, their food supply was really around them. The farmer that was putting the food in the grocery store just lived down the street or, or, or in their area, right? And so then we started to see these new products uh, programs come out that our farmers could uh, participate in, like the USDA Farmers to Family, um, you know, food box program. Um, you know, there was programs that were already being developed, like Market Maker, which was an it's an online. Um, sort of matches up growers with restaurants and, and, and people because there was all of a sudden this year there was a resurgence of two things. One, you know, I, maybe I need to be responsible for my own food. Uh, I think I need to grow something in my backyard. I, okay, my backyard's just a cement slab. How do I do that? Right. And that's when the USDA Urban Ag Toolkit really did come in handy. Um, but the second thing is like, there's this new resurgence in preserving food, right? So people all of a sudden wanted to learn how to can. All the millennials wanted to learn how to can. And I'm like, oh my God, I got rid of my ball jars like years ago. But no, so um, I think what happened is now people wanted to buy a carton of peaches or a car. And so they would go onto the market maker and they would find out uh, who, who could get it. Can they ship it? blah, blah, blah. And so that was really great. Uh, com com the community supported ag, CSAs really uh, came through. They did the touchless deliveries to folks they, or they would meet at their county uh, government center and do distributions out to people. So that was good. Um, you know, the farmer's markets 
all my homegrown by heroes people i'm so proud of them and the stories just keep are so you know we're just hurting to hear about what had ha has have happened this past year but you know um some of the farmers markets were open some weren't uh some people they had built clientele up at the farmers markets and they did touchless deliveries to them you know and then also you have people that are they're growing right they're still growing and they're still gleaning. They're still taking food to the food banks uh, and, and feeding folks. Um, and then, you know, we, we saw some more community gardens come up because, you know, we were we have an egg in the classroom and we had all these uh, gardens at the schools, but the schools weren't in session. So we saw a lot of people needing to get outside, uh, get some exercise, get some fresh air before they went stir crazy. And they started developing these community gardens. And we've we've actually, we got a huge donation of seed from Patriot uh, Seed Company. I'll give them a plug. And uh, we, we've been sending seeds out to people to start community gardens. So it's been um, really interesting there. You know, there has been some problems with those that are in animal production, um, getting their animals uh, processed to, to sell. Um, and I think that's going to be ongoing for a while. So we're looking at solutions to help in that arena, because I think what well, God hopes, you know, nothing like this ever happens again, but it's been a huge wake up call on a lot of different levels um, for folks. And so I think we're going to see changes um, moving forward, you know, not just with a virtual component to every conference that we have, but I think there's going to be uh, changes in people are taking their food seriously. They're valuing it more. I think we're going to see a decrease in in waste. I think we're going to see more preservation of the foods. I think we are going to see more people growing uh, in their backyards and sharing. You know, you can only process so many bushels of tomatoes, right? And then you can have to give it away to your neighbors. But you know, it worked. And that brings back a sense of community, which again always seems to come around food and meals, you know, um, and it always has. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you so much. And as a longtime canner, yes, I had trouble finding uh, canning supplies this summer. And um, yes, as a livestock producer, getting my animals processed this year has has been a challenge as well. But, um, you know, like you, we saw just our farmers all across the country doing innovative things and, you know, working really hard to get their product to the customers and directly to the customers. So, you know, while it has been a huge challenge, challenge there's been some great opportunities for our producers all across the country um, with, with folks really interested in getting that local food directly from their farmers. So one thing I would add, Marco, is that yeah. in normal distribution systems, you, you know, farmer picks, it takes about 10 days or so, uh, eight to, you know, to get from the farm to the grocery shelf to the consumer. You do lose some nutritional value. When you do grow locally, you can keep the product, whatever it is, on the trees or on the ground until it's more ripe. And uh and it can be delivered immediately. You can eat it the same day that it's picked. So there's this, there's an appreciation for that. If, and if you're like a um, a foodie, uh, that's really you know important to you. And and so I do think these relationships that have been developed during this pandemic with our growers is is going to continue uh, forward. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Sarah, you want to share um, some of the impacts of COVID and how you've seen it um, impact your your urban production or others that you work with? Sure. Yeah. I mean, some of the same things that Jeanette talked about, of course, um, happen in this micro urban space as well. Um, and there were, you know, lots of concerns on how are we going to um, make sure needy people are fed and and just in general, people have access to food. Um, there was a lot of work in DC. Uh, there was so much collaboration that occurred with uh, folks in the city who deliver food. And I don't mean like, yes, of course, I mean places like the Capital Area Food Bank, but I also mean just grocery stores and farmers markets. I mean, for all people. And uh, organizations, say in Virginia or Maryland, 
where most of our, not actually, that's not where most of our food comes from, but a great deal of our food comes from Virginia, Maryland, um, and how to make that work where, um, uh, you know, these new pathways had to be created because there was so much disruption because of COVID. So my observation um, with the Food Policy Council and working with local farmers was that was essential and it happened immediately. And the other thing I'll tell you is that the, the people who instigated that in Washington, D.C. happened to be veterans. Not because they were veterans, but probably because they were veterans, right? Because of that go-to attitude that veterans have. They were the ones who led the charge on some of this great work that was forged in, in the, we call it the DMV, not Department of Motor Vehicles, but DC, Maryland, Virginia, um, to make sure that people were fed. Um, it was really great to watch. And then um, in terms of the composting situation, uh, so some composters, we have we have three other, so my organization is, has been started and is owned by a, a veteran. And we have two other composting organizations in DC that are also uh, owned and started by veterans. And those two composting organizations actually had a boost in business because everybody was at home, people weren't going to restaurants and they had more food waste. So, I mean, they, they couldn't deal with the, the demand of all the people who needed, um, because they were, they are, sorry, they, they are personal home pickup types of composting companies. They come to your house, they take the bucket, they give you a clean bucket, and then they come back a week later and take your next bucket. And they were, you know, two buckets, three buckets, instead of just one bucket kind of situation and just exploding with customers. It was really great for their business. Our business, on the other hand, <sighs> went down because we work with, uh, we don't work with, with households. We work with restaurants. We work with universities. We work with hospitals. Well, hospitals were still fine, unfortunately, but universities, restaurants, um, cafes, et cetera, et cetera, they're all out of business. So we had a grant from the DC government to do, to, to uh, install a machine and, and help this cafe to start their own composting. It was attached actually to the very first farm I ever worked at. I worked at this farm for a year, right in the city. And it was, the cafe was attached to that farm. So I even knew all the folks and were able to facilitate all this work to be done. Uh, but rut row, the cafe wasn't open. So there wasn't any compost. Yeah, so that was, you know, I mean, DC government obviously understood. And now we're back on track because, um, you know, DC government has allowed restaurants to open and um, so there is there is food waste now, but it's certainly not as much food waste as we had imagined and is needed for this composting machine. Our, our machines are not small. They need a lot of food waste. Um, so that has been very challenging for us. And I mean, just like everybody else and we're ad adjusting and uh, figuring out new ways to, to serve um, the community, um, but it, it, it took some innovation. Yeah. I think we've all had to have a lot of innovation uh, this year. <laughs> it's caused us to be uh, very, very creative. So, Sean, I know you shared how much uh, food that you guys have donated from your from your farm this year due to COVID, and really, you know, focusing on feeding people. But I would love for you to just share, you know, the impacts that you've seen COVID have on your farm and your production. Um, maybe some of your markets and some of your the programming that your organization does. Absolutely. Um, COVID has definitely been a big hurdle, but we're vets. We know how to adjust and, and make do. And so that's exactly what we did. Um, luckily, we have a really good team at Growing Veterans that's very malleable and flexible. And, and we decided to take advantage of some of these um, virtual opportunities whether it's boosting our presence on youtube or showing uh skills-based videos on how to plant seed harvest etc um being available and being um yeah being available is, is has been the biggest thing for us um you know since we have donated so much food um unfortunately on the flip side our markets kind of dried up um, normally, we would sell um, the bulk of our produce to a, um, a local resort, uh, Semiami Resort, which was a, is a beautiful place, and they have terrific food um, that they would utilize our produce to create. So that poof is gone. What are we going to do? Well, we said we have to figure something out. COVID-19 is now, you know, taking 
front and center of everybody's priorities. And, and for us, you know, a large portion of our income is through grants. And so we um, decided to shift, you know, even more of our production towards feeding the community. We've already historically been, you know, um, donating food, but this year we decided to donate pretty much everything we grew. And so that made it, um, made us uh, very palatable for some of these grant opportunities, community grants, so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, we've taken a 50% hit in um, private donorship and business donors and so on and so forth. And, you know, um, for us, it's adapt and overcome. That's just the way it has to be. There's no failure is not an option. And, and like I said, the people are the number one priority when it comes to our mission and whether that's the community, whether that's the veterans, um, we, have taken this as an opportunity to kind of really do a gut check as to what is important to us. And that was feeding the people. So we've diverted, you know, a lot of our programming to, um, you know, meet that need and to also be able to connect with people because that's ultimately our goal. Um, so we've, we do, uh, we had, a what we called a Friday morning coffee check-in where I would do an hour long um, check-in with everybody via Zoom. Um, we'd put it out. It's an open door to anybody that wanted to participate. They would um, drop in. I would just check in and say, hey, how are you doing? What are some of the issues that you're facing in your community? Um, we've had people from all over the country uh, chime in and, and share and connect and I think the biggest thing for people, you know, and I keep coming back to isolation because that is ultimately what, you know, is, is, is the most deadly as far as I'm concerned, uh, especially within the veteran community, um, you know, to be able to reach out to people, to show them that we still are there for them. And we still have people come out to the farm. You know, we do have to maintain the guidelines and protocols, Washington state COVID-19 pandemic stuff, but, but we still had, uh, reoccurring um, veterans and, um, you know, local uh, uh, volunteers and so on and so forth come out because they need to get involved with something. And so we've been able to um, continue. We haven't really missed a beat. We didn't really sh shut down anything. We still have VA work studies. We still have Veteran Conservation Corps interns. Um, but yeah, it has been a challenge. And so uh, this year we've, you know, really decided hey, it's all about the people. Let's get the food out to the people. If we can um, recoup some of those that, that money through grants and, and, and donorship, you know, that's, that, that's the only real option that we have. And so we've been pursuing that. And um, it's really forced me to kind of diversify my skill set because now I have to go and out into the world and, 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 and convince people that uh, they need to invest in, in us and the veterans that, um, you know, that come through our doors and the community as well. So um, an investment in growing veterans is an investment in the community and it's an investment in feeding the community. So that's been kind of the shift that we've had to make. Um, it's been difficult, but it's not uh, above or beyond anything that we're capable of. And, um, you know, we're, we're constantly evolving and that's kind of just been our motto since, since COVID kicked off. Thank you, Sean. Well, this has been just an amazing discussion so far and we're kind of nearing the end of our times. So I'm going to wrap a couple of questions up into my last question um, for, for our panelists. And um, Jeanette, I'll probably start back over with you. And the question is, one, what advice would you give to veterans who are interested in, you know, in urban farming or getting connected to agriculture? And then the second part of that is how can the listeners of this, how can they connect with your organization or, you know, for, you know, Sarah and Sean, um, your, your businesses and, and those resources? I know we've, we've mentioned a lot of resources and a lot of things that we hope um, veterans connect to. So if you just kind of share what your kind of parting advice is for those who are interested in pursuing agriculture and then share those resources, how they can connect with you, um, that would be great. So Jeanette, I'll start with you. Since this panel is about urban agriculture, I think I'm gonna focus on advice for that. Um, I, I would strongly support it. You know, we have a lot of veterans in the area. I think there's three things urban agriculture does, is it provides 
um, access to food, good nutritious food. It helps with the poverty that we see in inner cities. Uh, and it also, it when you put in a community garden or you put in a garden, uh, a lot of times uh, you teach people how to cook, they have to learn how to cook with, with basic ingredients again, and you teach them about nutrition. Um, and there's, there's lots of resources available, master gardeners, there's your ex county extension offices uh, that can help you. And a lot of, and, and you have to realize you don't have to be everything all at once. It's, it's you could take baby steps and it, cause otherwise it's too overwhelming, right? And, um, and you, and you grow into it. And I think, you know, urban agriculture fulfills a lot of needs. There are um, food deserts and, and that doesn't mean there's no food. It just means that you have to go shop or the local corner store that may not sell fresh fruits and vegetables and produce. So I think um, to look at that, um, you know, the food insecurity, um, you know, the re retired folks even, they just love to grow in their backyards, have that abundance. There's a pride in that product that you produced, right? And to share it with your neighbors and the people down the street. And again, connecting our communities. And I think um, there are a lot of small spaces in towns that and land available if you look. There is the rooftops, there's places in between buildings. There's, um, you know, these edible landscapes that are created out of people's backyards and herb gardens. There's um, under utility poles, under even even under our big three ways we have out here. Uh, and, you know, you may have to get together with a few folks to figure out all the rules and regulations, but I think the reward that comes from it is very uh, beneficial. Um, and so I think they can connect the farmer veteran on this. Um, you know, we our phone number I'll give you it's five three zero seven five six one three nine five. Uh, we'll gladly take your calls. We our website is farmvetco.org. Uh, you know, you can contact us there. There's a support uh, email that can you know go there. We're on all the social media platforms, um, or you can contact one of our chapters. Um, but yeah, we'll be glad to help anyone who's ready to start this journey. We have a couple of our staff that are actually experts in the whole farm to fork, uh, local food movement, uh, and regenerative agriculture that they would just really uh, love to give you the resources uh, to do your research and get going. Yes, thank you so much, Jeanette. All right, Sarah, I'll go hey, to you next. Um, great, Jeanette, that reminded me, I started as a master gardener and she's totally right. One, she's, she's right that don't do everything at once because there's so much to do and it's gonna overwhelm you. But a master gardener class is really a great way to dive in. I loved it. Um, uh, so I would say that, that the things that I really think um, that you need to think about if you're gonna start farming are some of the like unsexy aspects of uh, farming. So business plan. I know I mentioned business plan earlier on the panel. Um, th that is, and, and Farmer Veteran Coalition can help you with that, by the way, and, and Small Business Administration. I mean, there's lots of resources out there for you, but Farmer Veteran Coalition is a really great resource for that. Um, it's it, it's not fun. It's tiresome. It makes my head ache just thinking about it. Um, but it's really important because at the end of the day, you need to survive. Um, and, and it's a business. Farming is a business. No matter how what it is, my beekeeping, it was a business. It is a business still. Um, Second thing I would say is learn how to be an advocate. Veterans have a really hard time being advocates because when you're active duty military, you're not allowed to be an advocate. So you kind of hold on to that. It took me a long time to realize that I could advocate for what I thought was important. Um, and, and like most recently with the, the DC zero waste omnibus bill that just was passed, I put language in that bill. There's language that I wrote in that bill. And if you had told me I was gonna do that 10 years ago, I would have thought you were crazy. But you, if you want something to make your operation safer, better, um, you are a civilian. It is, your, it is your absolute right to contact your council member. It is your absolute right to contact your congressman, 
It is your absolute right to testify. In fact, uh, when I was with Farmer Veteran Coalition, we testified in front of Congress twice um, because we have things to say to inform um, farmer veterans and you have things to say about your operations. So your ideas matter and you should, if you have time, I know you have a long list of things to do as a farmer. So if you have time, add that one to it. It's important because it really affects policy and it affects your life. Um, and then the last thing I would say is about networking. I know I've brought up networking before, but I just can't stress enough how important that is. And I'll give you an example. Um, I'm on this composting uh, network that's all across the United States. There is not one dumb question that's asked. There is always somebody who is out there to give you a slice of their time and their advice to answer your question. I've learned so much by being on this um, listserv. And um, so get on these listservs. Uh, and get on these, um, uh, connect with people, and that's really going to be helpful is to connect with people because as a wise farmer once told me when I said, wow, when did you feel like you really knew what you were doing? You've been farming for 20 years. And her response to me was, no, I've only farmed 20 times. Everybody feels like they are uh, have something to learn and they have advice to give, and it's your role to take that advice, and then someday you're going to be given the advice as well. Um, the only thing, the only last thing I'll say is I have to do a shout out to Farmer Veteran Coalition again, because even though this happened, I had nothing to do with it. I didn't write the grant and I joined loop closing afterwards. We did receive a grant from, from Farmer Veteran Coalition. So I suggest to all of you, no matter where you are in this, your stage of farming, apply for that Farmer Veteran Coalition Fellowship Grant. It is, uh, they give out a lot of money. They're very thoughtful about, um, uh, supporting people, they support uh, folk. I, I, I was never. I don't. I don't know all the details. I was never involved in the selection process, but seeing the results, they select people from every walk of farming life. So um, you have a good chance of getting it if you apply for it. And, and then there's other fellowships as well um, that you can get from um, the Young Farmers Coalition has one as well. Um, they do a, a, a collaboration with. Um, Chip Tole, I always mispronounce it, but you know that restaurant <laughs> that serves burritos and, and tacos. Um, but yeah, so get, and I, a Farmer Veteran Coalition's uh, fellowship is open now. So get in there and get on it. That's my advice. Thank you, Sarah. Very good advice. Um, all right, Sean, if you'll share with us your advice and then how folks can connect with, with you. Yeah, first off, I'll, I'll just say, if you're interested in getting involved with Growing Veterans or contacting us, please go to www.growingveterans.org. Follow us on Instagram, that we keep that constantly updated. You can be front and center in just about everything that we do on the day-to-day -day if you follow us on our social media, Facebook, so on and so forth. Um, I can speak to the nonprofit side of the house because um, I do get a lot of phone calls and I know that there's a lot of interest for um, budding farmers um, that are interested in doing something very similar to what we're doing all over the country. I get calls about this. So um, my advice to you would be start small, have a focused, clear, definitive mission, and then grow with a purpose. And what I mean by that is, you know, Think about the mission that you that you att uh, are attempting to take on and break that down and see, you know, how how convoluted can it get? Because things can get really sticky when you start when you have a very broad mission. So so really focus your intent and 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 grow from there and because you can always grow from there. So that's my biggest piece of advice. It's very simple. It sounds very simplistic, but it's also been something that's been really huge and it's something that I've had to learn over the years. Um, and, and I think it'll serve you well. Uh, another aspect to it is ask for help. You have to ask for help. You have to be willing to ask for help. I know as veterans and I know uh, we, we, we like to just kind of pick ourselves up by our bootstraps and just go for it. And, and, and if we can't do it, there's no, then it can't be done. So, um, yeah, ask for help. You know, there's organizations, you know, obviously farmer veteran coalition. I like to think of them as like the overarching umbrella for veteran farmers, uh, you know, in, in, in the nation. Um, I've sent so many people their direction, um, you know, that, whether they're interested in, in, in farming or they're interested in 
raising cattle and so on and so forth, they have a myriad of, of opportunities for you to get connected and, and find the resources that you need and plug you into people that are doing exactly what you're interested in. So really lean on these resources that exist, do your research and ask for help um, because people are more than happy to help you. I know I am and I know these folks are. So thank you so much for having me and, and uh, yeah, please check us out, growingveterans.org. Don, that is some really, really great advice. I mean, starting small, whether that's a nonprofit or a farm, I mean, that's the advice I give farmers all the time. Start small, you know, make small mistakes before you make big, big mistakes. Um, so start small and then you can grow from there. And then asking for help. That is so true. And there are so many wonderful resources um, as we've shared today. And I do want to give my organization a plug in CAT and our ATRA program, if you go to our website, which is www.attra.org, we are an information service for farmers. And so we have all aspects of agriculture covered from soils, urban agriculture, livestock, marketing, the whole gamut. Um, we have resources and we have technical specialists who are available to help answer questions and get you connected to resources. So if you are interested in farming, please check us out. And as I mentioned, um, you can find links there to our Arm to Farm program as well if you're interested. And hopefully once COVID gets past us um, a little bit, we'll be able to ramp up our Arm to Farm trainings again. And we have several of those planned all across the country, um, including urban Arm to Farm trainings. So, um, you know, our week-long training program that's specifically focused on urban agriculture. So. We have a few of those in the works as well. So please um, check us out and, um, and get connected. Uh, once again, panelists, thank you so much. I so enjoyed this, getting to hear from you three and you guys sharing your experiences and all of the wonderful work that you are doing and the resources that you have for our veterans all across the country. So. Um, just thank you so much, and um, I hope you, our listeners, have enjoyed this session. Wow, wow, wow. I hope you enjoy this panel as much as I did. We've been experiencing the same internet issues that the whole East Coast has been experiencing, so thank you for hanging around and choosing to listen to us, even if you didn't get a chance to see all the video. A big thank you to Margo Sean. Sarah and Jeanette for helping us understand what urban farming is all about. My takeaway from this discussion is that it's not as hard as you might have imagined to farm in an urban setting, become a beekeeper, work with compost, or support community-based agriculture organizations. The choices are vast, and as we heard, the programs that support veterans are really paying off. In addition to responses to your question, we've posted the web addresses for these organizations in the comments section. Please visit them for more information. As a reminder, the Veterans History Project is seeking all U.S. military veterans' stories. The project is every veteran's opportunity to leave their imprint to enrich the historical record. By participating, they ensure that history reflects their story and how their service impacted their life. Veterans' stories broaden and deepen our collective understanding of our shared history. If you're a veteran or no one, please visit loc.gov forward slash vets to download a field kit so you can have all the instructions and required forms to add a story to our archive. Our website also has a searchable veterans database, a 15 minute instructional video, resources for re researchers, educators, students and scouts, exhibits and more. Again, thank you for joining us for veteran grown urban farming. Take care and stay safe.